So I wanna welcome you tonight. My name is John Mayer. I'm the executive director of the Amesbury Carriage Museum. And I'm thrilled to see you all post postage stamp size or not with us tonight. So thank you for joining us. Um, before we get started, I wanna acknowledge our 2021 program sponsors. We have annual sponsors of Ed Selden and Lisa Witham, Amesbury Chair Company, Amesbury Industrial Supply, BB Alarms, and Sacris Design with Jennifer Sanborn. And then our program sponsors are Wayne Barbaro, Mike Harold and Leah Kabeen, Peter and Patty Hoyt, and Tom Pendergast. And actually, I am so grateful to our sponsors for all their help. They, they really help have enabled us to power through the pandemic, continue to do the things that we're doing. So um, thank you, program sponsors, for all your support. Um, tonight, we are thrilled to be able to offer the Bailey Lecture. This is a program that we began in 2016. We named it after the Bailey family as a way to acknowledge the long history of SR Bailey Company and the Bailey family and, the, and their work in the Amesbury community. And each year that we've offered this program, we've welcomed a thought leader, an expert, a specialist, somebody skilled, in urban planning, historic preservation, or other topics that shine lights on things that are new to us, but also help our community to learn a little bit more about um, the world around them. So tonight, um, I am very pleased to introduce Nate Robertson. Nate is um, Community and Economic Development Planner with the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission. And I learned about Nate because of his work in cultural mapping. And it just seemed highly appropriate to invite Nate to be part of this program in the midst of the pandemic, where we're learning more and more about those things that are important to us and those things that help make a community what it is. Oh, and, I, and before, oh, and here's Nate. Nate, I wanna just, um, for everyone on the Zoom, Mm -hmm. You know, we will mute all the microphones. Um, if you like, you sh should um, go to speaker view because I think that'll allow you to enjoy Nate and his slides a little bit better. Um, we're gonna let Nate run his program um, and then we'll take questions by chat. And then at the end, after we've answered chat questions, we often go live and just allow for a nice social interaction. So bear with us. If there's something that you have a question about, type it in the chat and we'll get to it as soon as we can. And the other thing I wanted to point out, and I think Nate, you're gonna do this anyway. Um, Nate has a really um, fun interactive, and I think you just put the uh, website down on the bottom of the chat. So if everyone would look, um, and if you can open a new window and go to that website, Nate is gonna guide us. And I think you'll find that that will make this program even that much more fun, but I'm not gonna spill the beans. Nate Robertson, it's a thrill to have you with us tonight. Thank you and welcome to our, our Zoom program. Thank you so much, John. And uh, thanks for all the sponsors and everybody that, that helps contribute to make this, uh, make this lecture series possible. Uh, I was really honored to be asked to come here and share a little bit about what MVPC does and to share a little bit about our cultural uh, mapping exercise and the importance of cultural planning and cultural events and spaces and institutions. Uh, in general, the importance of culture in our the everyday fabric of, of our communities. So uh, happy to, to kind of jump into to my presentation. And uh, uh, John was right. I'm gonna try to make this as interactive as possible. I'm a big believer in participatory planning. Um, and I try to incorporate that praxis in, into my presentations a little bit as well. Um, I was never a great student. I never never thrived when I was just being talked to. Um, so I, I try to make this as uh, back and forth as, as possible. 
So I put a link in the chat. It's the pollev.com slash MerrimackVal427. And uh, there'll be a couple little polling questions I'll ask folks. Uh, the best way to probably do that would be to, to minimize um, uh, the Zoom screen and then open up. It would be a web, it would be a web page where you'll be prompted with a question. Um, and we'll see how well that goes. Sometimes it, sometimes it goes very smoothly and other times it's a little rockier as we all familiarize ourselves with technology. So um, always worth the, the effort though. And I'm going to share screen. Is that coming through okay for everybody? Um, no. No, well, let me try that again. I think I forgot to click the button. No, <clears throat> still no. All right, all right. Let's try this. There we go. And how is that? We're, yep, we're good. Getting a little feedback loop, but you can see that, that full screen slide okay? Perfect. Great, great. Um, so uh, like John said, I'm, I'm with the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission and uh, a little bit about uh, what a planning commission is, uh, a little introduction over to, to who we are, uh, is we're a regional planning agency. Uh, we're a government entity. Uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is carved out into different territories, which different regional planning agencies manage. Uh, Merrimack Valley Planning Commission's territory consists of 15 communities along the, the Merrimack River from Andover all the way to the ocean and as far south as Rowley. It encompasses around 360,000 people, 15,000 businesses, uh, and a host of plants, animals, and, and everything in between. My favorite being the short-nosed sturgeon. Uh, it's an incredibly diverse region, as, as many of us know. It has post-industrial mill cities like Lawrence and Haverhill, suburban communities like Andover and Georgetown, rural communities like Rowley and West Newbury, and coastal communities like Newburyport and Salisbury. Each community has its own unique characteristics, challenges, and strengths. It makes it a really fun place to work, and it also makes it a really great place to live. And as of three hours ago, I just uh, I became a, a, a property owner here in Haverhill. So awesome. Um, we, yeah, we closed on a, a I... me and my partner closed on a condo today. So um, I've, I've lived in Haverhill for, for several years now, but uh, excited to um, be even more wed to the region. Um, the reason region, regional planning agencies were created is because Massachusetts is sort of unique in how strong municipalities yeah, are. Dave Roberts is from the Merrimack Valley Planning. I'm getting a little feedback. I think yeah. someone's not. Planning. All good? Yep, yeah, I just okay. muted. Okay, it happens, it happens. Okay. Um, so municipalities in Massachusetts uh, are really strong. They govern really, uh, they have a lot of power in how they govern. They govern independent of any sort of countywide entity or regional government. And Massachusetts is home to hundreds of oftentimes very tiny municipalities, each with their own management systems and governing bodies. And this can present a lot of challenges when dealing with issues which do not stop at municipal borders whether it's economic issues, housing issues, water infrastructure, environmental concerns, um, we know that uh, we need to work together in order to tackle a lot of these larger issues. So at the end of the day, MVPC's mission is to promote the orderly growth and good stewardship of the region. And we do that by convening municipalities, aligning resources, aligning visions, and coming up with common solutions to common problems. We have four, four main program areas, um, transportation planning, environmental planning, community and economic development planning, and geographic information systems and information technology services. Essentially, what these allow us to do is really help our municipalities in, in all areas um, and help them operate using 21st century technology. So who am I? Um, well, <laughs> The question I ask myself every morning now. Uh, my name is Nate Robertson and I am currently uh, work in the community and economic de development 
uh, as a community and economic development planner in, uh, for MVPC. Prior to that, I worked for a private public partnership focused on economic development in the city of Haverhill, which included everything from housing to business retention. And prior to that, I worked in public health on Cape Cod, where I focused on infectious disease and overdose prevention. And what this has given me is, is kind of a, a comprehensive view of how all issues are really interconnected and an understanding of, of the holistic approach we need to take when we talk about building desirable, resilient, and thriving communities. Community and economic development often don't mean any, but anything to anybody outside of uh, the planning field or, or, or government. So essentially what I do is, is uh, business retention and recruitment, sort of like industry specific manufacturing in particular in this region, housing and land use planning, arts and culture programming, and downtown revitalization strategy. My passion is really working in small post-industrial mill cities, but at the end of the day, my job is the same in every municipality, which is to help make that community thrive. I like to think of my job and I like to think of community planning in general as uh, analogous to gardening. We just make sure that places have the right mixture of ingredients to, to grow and flourish. So what is a community? It's gonna be a word I'm gonna be throwing around a lot tonight. Um, so I figured we'd come to a common kind of definition here. Uh, community is commonly understood as a social unit with common norms, uh, religion, values, custom, or identity. It can be as small as a handful of people or as large as an entire nation. When we think about our own selves, we know that we exist within multiple communities simultaneously. They can overlap, they can be linked familially or, or self-identifying. Communities may share a, a common space or a shared geography, as large as New England or as small as a particular neighborhood. Communities don't always have to share a physical space. For instance, you know, online communities. Uh, here we are all on Zoom, so that's a pretty good example of a of a, a non-physical uh, community. However, for this talk, we'll be really focused on our built environments that host communities like, like neighborhoods and towns and, and cities. All right, so this is gonna be the first big test of our, uh, of our crowdsourcing here. Uh, I wanna focus on what, I wanna ask everybody here on, on what makes a thriving community. So this will be interactive. Your answers are gonna populate a word cloud, which will be live. Um, and um, so in, in your minds, uh, do a little bit of thinking about what makes a thriving community. Just fire out some, you can make as many entries as you want, uh, coffee shops, downtowns, parks, um, and that will all populate a word cloud. And I'm going to uh, open up that word cloud now. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. And if you go to that link in the chat, pollev.com slash Merrimack Val 427. You should um, be prompted with a, um, with a question, that very question. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. We're already getting some answers rolling in. Can folks see that that word cloud okay? Very cool, yeah. All right, so they're still coming in, still coming in. Restaurants, stores, openness, space, waterfront. Downtown seems to be uh, the leading. People, also very important. Events, diversity growth. This is great. Profits, connections, opportunities, walkable space, history, compassion, experiences, volunteerism. Schools, restaurants, politics, for better or worse. <laughs> participation, neighborhoods, businesses, stores. Oh, this is fantastic. 
Yes, yes, yes to all of this. <laughs> I'm going to go back to my uh, PowerPoint here. Um, let's see, screen two. So there was a lot of good stuff in here and can folks see that the, the question prompt once again? Um, downtowns, walkability, connections, people, um, saw some overarching categories, uh, businesses, goods and services, places to shop seem to pop up. Um, some, other, some other things, I'm, I'm always thinking from the, the planning lens, so infrastructure that makes all that stuff possible. You know, electricity, roads, sewers, water, uh, internet. Um, these are all great examples of things uh, in thriving communities. And the challenge uh, for community planners like myself is how do we categorize all this stuff? You know, uh, it's such a wide spectrum. How do we how do we plan for all this stuff? How do we help communities get all of this stuff? Uh, community planning at the end of the day is a science and part of that work entails uh, documenting, categorizing and, and mapping all this information in a way that, that makes sense and that we can turn into a, a practice. Um, mapping as a tool. So it's mapping, I prob probably more than ever mapping is a, a tool of all of us used in our daily lives with, with Google Maps and Waze. Um, it's a tool used by community planners, especially to visualize data and to better understand communities. Um, personally, I've always been kind of a map geek. Uh, even as a kid, I threw myself into like reading old ancient history of, of Rome and I would get lost in all those old territory maps and battle maps and all that kind of stuff. And I was always been a big uh, fan of the, uh, one of the top map geeks out there, J.R.R. Tolkien, um, and the, the fantasy worlds he built around his, his love of maps and languages. Um, one of the reasons I love mapping is because how well it communicates huge amounts of information and more clearly and quickly than you could ever get by reading. However, mapping is just a tool. It can be used for good, it can be used for bad, and it has a long legacy of racism and classism, especially in the planning world. Uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to show you a little bit about how we use mapping to highlight particular information. So you may, you Amesbury <laughs> folks may, re may recognize this. Um, this is a aerial photograph of downtown Amesbury. It's in it's a topographic map. So those little squiggly lines uh, indicate the elevation of downtown. Mapping is often used to, to highlight natural features like topography or wetlands, flood zones, forest cover. This is the same aerial photograph of downtown, except this is a, a much more human uh, uh, map. This is a parcel uh, overlaid to the, on the aerial, it's parcel map overlaid on the aerial photography. So these are obviously man-made boundaries indicating the legal boundaries of each particular parcel. This is a way for us to categorize ownership and buying and selling and uh, who owns what. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the Amesbury Carriage Museum is parcel number 53-276. Am I right there? That's where we will be occupying. It's owned by Greg Jardis and Amesbury Industrial Supply, but we have a 99-year lease for 2,800 square feet of space in that building. So you've got our right location, and we just are tenants in the space, thanks to Greg. Nice, nice. And it's that first floor space right on the kind of the... The right hand right. side of that parcel. Yep, that's correct. Yep, that's super exciting. Yeah. This is another map. Um, it's a little bit uh, farther out. It's a business inventory, which we maintain at MVPC. Each dot represents a business with fewer than 25 employees on the books. Planners use this to identify small businesses uh, and work. We work with our municipal partners and economic development partners and chambers of commerce and folks like that to ensure that these businesses are being communicated to, that they're getting the resources they need in order to survive, especially during COVID-19, and to do a bunch of you know, planning work in general. 
Uh, these business maps always sort of look like population density maps. Wherever there are people, there are businesses. This is sort of a, a traditional zoning map, the classic uh, classic zoning map in the in the planning world. It's a tool uh, municipalities use to dictate what sorts of buildings and activities are allowed in particular places. Some zones like open space conservancy are used to preserve natural spaces. Zones like rural clusters are used to restrict development to large acre single family homes. Zones like industrial or office park used to dictate where larger business or industrial uses go. And uh, central business, like you see right in the core there, it says central business district. Um, we often use that to uh, uh, encourage dense multi-use facilities like those four story, five story buildings with a mixture of residences and retail. Um, that are so common in, in downtown cores. Zoning is one of the major influencers for our built environments and what goes on in them. And as I said at the start, um, planning has a long legacy of racism and classism. Mapping is a tool uh, and it's one that we often, mapping is a tool and, and we often use boundaries and maps to cut up the world into pieces and that uphold or reinforce oppressive power dynamics. Um, a good example of this can be seen in a, what this is, a red line map. So after the Great Depression, the U.S. government set out to assess the riskiness of mortgages and left, it left behind a stark portrait of racism and classism that continues to impact our communities to this day. These maps were created by the federally sponsored Homeowners Loan Corporation, and they were used to dictate the terms and condition or even the existence of mortgages in particular neighborhoods. So this is in Amesbury. This is actually a redlined map uh, in Haverhill, probably from the 1930s, I want to say. I don't have a specific date for it, but this is right down the river. And you can see the remarks for neighborhood D2 that's highlighted. Um, it's marked in red due to the presence of immigrants, um, or as they say in this, the, the foreign element. This designation would be used to uh, not give loans to people or on properties in neighborhoods, in the red neighborhoods. The presence of black people would almost always automatically trigger a red zone, shutting off opportunity for investment or home ownership opportunities. Uh, redlining, it is often credited with vastly exacerbating inequities along racial and class lines. And it really goes to show you that mapping is a tool and boundaries can be a knife that we use to cut up the world in really damaging ways. When it comes to cultural mapping, who decides what gets mapped matters. Mapping exercises are often a reflection of the people that conduct them. If it's only people in positions of power or people in particular circles, um, maps and data will skew accordingly. So it's vital that any data collection, any mapping exercises, any planning be as participatory and inclusive as possible. So where's culture in all of this? Um, based on what folks contributed to the question of kind of what makes a thriving <laughs> community, we know that culture that that cultural things are really important to have a flourishing community. How does it get measured? How does it get mapped? How is it incorporated? Culture is one of these tricky things. It can be a little intangible. It's sort of a I always call it the connective tissue that that binds all these different assets together. Um, these are great questions and ones that community planners have often struggled with answering, but let's kind of start by defining what is culture. Culture is a loaded world, a word. It's often talked about as we look back at like past great historical cultures and the ancient Egyptians or Greeks. For many, the very word conjures up uh, images of old royal balls or expensive museum galleries but these are all misconceptions. Culture is happening all around us constantly. It's simply community expression, celebrations, family gatherings, stories, music, shared values, uh, beliefs, art, activities, gathering places, events, food, which is my personal favorite. <laughs> the list goes on and on. Culture exists in the smallest of things and in the biggest and grandest of things. Culture is enjoying an afternoon walk in the park, getting an empanada at the bodega, 
And it's also a grand 19th century ball with Austro-Hungarian royalty. Demystifying what gets called culture or what qualifies as culture is important work for us all to engage in. Culture isn't an exclusive club or something only relegated to the wealthy. It's something that we all co-create daily. Culture is for everyone. So on that note, now that we've kind of defined culture and hopefully demystified what kind of qualifies as culture, I've got another question, which is the next on our list, which is what are some things that you really love to do in your community? Um, what are some things that this doesn't, or, or what are some things that you used to love doing in a community or in a past community? It doesn't have to be a, a current one. It could be a fond memory, something you have a uh, memory fond, uh, remember fondly about your hometown or something that you do in your daily life today. And I'm going to go bring up that same link. Let me just turn it on here. And it should be activated now. So if you go right back to that same link, it should prompt you now with a different question, which is just some, what are some things that, that you enjoy doing in your community? And this will be a, a little different. I'm gonna share the screen here, screen one. Hopefully folks can see that. Sharing food, dancing, museum, walking, going out to eat. You can tell I was biased because I put the Tripoli pizza as the background. So <laughs> shout out to all of you fellow eaters out there. <laughs> Art festivals, live music, walking downtown, taking a walk. I'm also a big walker. Storytelling, walking along the river. The one, uh, the one common thing I feel like all municipalities share in, in the Merrimack Valley is our links to the river, visits with friends, dining out, library, friends. Here we go, bike riding, walking the dog, shopping, visiting neighborhood. That's a whole, that's a whole weekend right there. Living within walking distance to downtown, photos of interesting historic architecture, getting to know folks at Amesbury Carriage Museum, <laughs> music performances, art events, interacting with people, a pleasant physical environment, being on the water, meeting people, enjoying time with elder residents, biking. These are all great. Walking to town for a dinner out volunteering helping others contributing these are all great keep them coming you guys are uh, you guys are, are doing doing really well concerts discovering new places we have an active group here birding all right coffee surprise this is the first time coffee has made an appearance <laughs> music walking if anything, I feel like we this this group should do a, a like a downtown Amesbury walk. I think half of half of your audience is walkers. Mm. Riding my bike, there can be a bike contingent too. Meeting friends, these are all these are all great. I'm gonna jump back. Nature trails. That's another one. I'm kind of surprised I haven't seen. Uh, uh, like parks, forests. I guess that kind of goes with walking though. Go to the movies, wine with neighbors, bird watching, showing off for downtown, the waterfall. I love that. Volunteering. I don't want to I don't want to stop sharing, but I'm going to. I could I could look at this stuff all day. Going to the beach. Yeah, how the beach, of course. How could we forget? All right. Meeting new people, they're still rolling in. And let me go back to the
share screen and it should be screen two. All right, does that, that look good on these transitions? Yep. Okay, excellent. Um, thanks everybody for contributing. Yeah, those were all great examples. And, and when I ask people that question, you know, a lot of it, at least for me, I feel like these are all kind of like deeply personal in a way. These are ways that we spend our time, ways that we connect with our surroundings outside of work and outside of the, the nine to five. Um, they're all important in their own way. And they show us the things that we value in our communities, um, experiences, activities, memories, um, all of this stuff can be really difficult to capture in a way that is easy to communicate. It's not like um, a sewer line that you can easily put on a map and say, well, that's where it is. Um, but if anything, these are just as important as a sewer line or more important mm. um, as they're deeply embedded into the very fabric of the community that we all live in. Um, it's these little important things that as community planners, it's really important for us to capture perspectives on. Um, they should be identified and represented during any planning activity. Um, crowdsourcing information, talking to communities, I find is always the best way to find out what people value about a particular place or a particular neighborhood. And whenever we're doing any sort of planning exercises, whether the, a neighborhood is getting redeveloped or there's new buildings or businesses coming into a downtown or, um, or uh, infrastructure upgrades, if you can't do any of those well, unless you have a good handle of what people value in that space. And um, when you do that, you can put together the resources to protect and preserve or expand and to make sure that all of that stuff that's important to people, those walking trails, those spots that people go birding, the places to shop, all of those things get incorporated and uh, into you know, new development or into the next evolution of a community, um, or they get protected and preserved um, in a way that, that keeps them and keeps people connected to their surroundings. There we go. So mapping culture, the missing link. All of these resources, events, places that have been highlighted um, can and should be represented as community assets. As I said, just as important as housing is, just as important as infrastructure is or, or businesses. But historically, arts and culture are not considered equal partners uh, to any you know, metaphorical table. They're not invited. Um, they're often seen as byproducts. And if they were incorporated, it was always kind of from the narrow lens of uh, nonprofit artwork or um, you know, related to the tourism industry, there was all really particular narrow views of how we understood culture in a place. But today cultural planning is understood a little more broadly as addressing community priorities uh, and putting the voices of regular people at the table. As a planner, I collect and synthesize data about transportation and businesses and infrastructure and schools and housing and demographics and wages and all, the list goes on and on. But notably missing from that list often is the events in a town that people enjoy or the how the corner store functions as a public hangout for some of the older folks in the neighborhood or how a parking deck hosts a weekly farmer's market uh, in the summer. You know, all of these really important but often intangible cultural assets that are so important and integral into the fabric of a community often kind of take a back seat or get left out of that conversation. Um, and you know, from, from I see it every day, quite literally absent from the map. You know, I work in a, in a field where we have mapping layers for, for everything, um, but uh, it's stronger in some sectors and it's, it's weaker in others. So, it's changing. Uh, more and more, we're seeing the importance of cultural planning um, and it's being prioritized. Community planning has changed dramatically over the years and more and more cultural planning is being rightfully seen as essential, just as any other discipline. Uh, after all, what is a community without culture? In fact, when we think about what makes a good community and a desirable community, it's not uncommon for the local culture to be at the top of that list. Um, 
culture is that I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a broken record. It's that intangible connective tissue that ties so much of a community together in shared common experience. And we know that prioritizing culture, pl uh, cultural planning enriches cultural life while helping fuel economic growth, enhancing safety and health and connectivity of communities. Not prioritizing culture uh, in communities has, has pretty serious negative consequences. And we've seen that historically play out. Uh, cultural events, nonprofits, artists, public spaces, these all tend to be resource strapped and uh, constantly in need of more funding because we've historically not valued them quite literally financially. Um, and we see the results of that. It keeps arts and cultural organizations vulnerable or at risk of shutting down or displacement. It creates less public life, which results in more dormant bedroom communities, which is a term used to describe commuter oriented suburban towns that sort of lack that local cohesion beyond a, a common school system. It leads to a more disconnected community where neighbors don't know each other or interact with one another, leading to loneliness and polarity and isolation. And um, like this is, this is changing. Communities are increasingly engaged in proactive cultural planning exercises because they rightfully see kind of the value in those communities that have rich cultural and public lives. And I'm gonna go through a couple examples um, of what different cities are doing. Um, this is in Durango, Colorado. And I, I picked this cause it's a, it's a really small, it's 19,000, um, it's a small town. And this was an effort led by their planning department and their city manager. Uh, and it was to add a cultural element into their comprehensive master plan update. So most communities have a master plan, which dictates, you know, where do we want to be in five years? Where do we want to be in 10 years? Um, and this was a, a way to have a, a section of that plan specifically crafted for arts and culture, focusing on empowering and celebrating the community's creative and cultural resources. Right down uh, in central mass here, we've got Worcester, which has been precedent setting in, in a lot of areas when it comes to cultural planning. And this was an effort led by a community foundation in the city itself. And they put significant money and resources into designing and activating public spaces. They have a lot of older vacant rundown properties like so many kind of older, older mill cities do. Um, and they said, what a great opportunity for us to engage local youth to engage people in the neighborhoods, to identify artists, and to, to pay them to help beautify these spaces and to bring local art and bring artists together and to celebrate it um, all through the lens of diversity and equity and inclusion uh, kind of threaded throughout their whole program. They've got a wonderful uh, strategic plan focused just on where do they wanna be culturally and creatively in, in five, 10, 15 years. And then uh, Merrimack Valley. So um, this is, this is a, a, a shameless plug for our own work, I guess. Uh, this was a, a, a effort that we uh, uh, led alongside of Essex County Community Foundation. And I know Karen is on the call. Uh, Essex County, County Community Foundation has been absolute leaders in the realm of cultural planning in Essex County. Um, and I wanted to highlight some of the work we're doing locally. Um, we entered kind of the cultural planning space in 2018, and I'm going to click uh, a link and walk through some of the project and take a look at our own cultural mapping project. And how am I doing on time here? Uh, this is, see, this is the problem. Once I get going. <laughs> I think we're good, Nate. I, you know, maybe uh, 10 more minutes and then we can get some questions in. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, this is fabulous. I, I, it's, it's great to see this. Great, great. So this was, um, again, this is a, a large project that was started in conjunction with Essex County Community Foundation starting in 2018. A little bit on the genesis of the project. Um, in 2018, Essex County Community Foundation launched its Creative County Initiative uh, in partnership with the Barr Foundation, the mission being to elevate arts and culture in Essex County. The goal has been to work with local communities to learn how to infuse culture, cultural development into community development with the belief that cultural action plans enrich cultural life while helping fuel economic growth um, and health and safety and connectivity. 
So in 2019, ECCF partnered with MAPC and us at MVPC to coordinate four cultural planning labs for municipal officials and planners and arts leaders and nonprofits and museums um, all in the private sector all over Essex County. We had meetings in Newburyport and Lawrence and Beverly and Peabody with over 120 people participating. And there were some clear next steps that kind of came out of that, that planning process and that visioning process. Uh, the first was a cultural asset mapping project um, and technical support from municipal planning efforts. And the second was to strengthen the regional infrastructure between artists, between cultural producers and between different stakeholders. Um, so I guess on one hand, it could be seen as like, what do we have? What's going on? What are the assets that, that we have here in the Merrimack Valley? And secondly, how do we put them all in the same room? How do we get them interacting more together and do some sort of almost coalition building and leadership training? So we launched in 2019, the Merrimack Valley Cultural Mapping Project. We had over 90 people at our kickoff event and um, then COVID-19 happened. <laughs> like many of us, we were uh, forced to pivot, forced to pivot with the best of them. And uh, we went digital. So we had all of these plans to do these really intimate gatherings and in-person participatory sort of planning exercises. And then we, we had to pivot and go digital to collect um, important places. So we asked people for two things. We asked people for, to contribute their stories, their artwork, uh, any other media, spoken word, audio. Um, and we asked people to, to put a point on a map and say like, what's, if it's in their own neighborhood or if it's a place they frequent, why that place was important to them. So it was a way to capture both art. Um, and it was also a credit to, to ECCF. They, they actually paid artists during this time. I know COVID-19 COVID really impacted the arts community. Yeah. So it was a way to, to help artists, um, and it, but it was also a way to collect them and have them working together. And for us to begin identifying some of those things in neighborhoods that people really valued. Um, the art was assembled into an expression book. I won't go through the whole thing, but the entire thing is in our uh, is in our web page, and I would definitely encourage you to check it out there. Each town has its the towns kind of carved up into chapters. There's a bunch of awesome writing about the Merrimack Valley. Um, these are some. This is some art that was contributed in, in Lawrence. Um, this is a little building on Lawrence Street. Now, whenever I go by it, I kind of remember this little, uh, <laughs> this, this piece of art. Um, and it was just kind of people's thoughts about what their neighborhoods meant to them and their own relationships to, to home. Um, it's a really, it's a, it's a cool piece. And then the second piece of it was the mapping. So all this, all this talk on mapping, we asked people, you know, to, to put a dot on the map. And like I said, before I'm, I'm really particular when it comes to like participatory stuff. Um, we could have come in and gotten a list of all the museums and gotten a list of all the statues and gotten a list of all the, like the historical societies and dropped them on a map and said, you know, we're done. Here are all the important places. But as we also know, that's not really a good reflection or an accurate reflection of what people value. Um, so the best way to get that information is right from the source. So, so we asked people to, to drop a pin and, and have them tell us. And if, if the historical statue made it on the list or, or not, you know, that was for, that was for the, was a, the people to decide. This is a sort of democratizing uh, mm -hmm. planning effort. So a couple, I'll walk you through a couple of things that were people picked out. Uh, one was the Methuen Spicket River Falls, which is a little footbridge in Methuen that's got um, rotating sort of art pieces on it. Um, actually, recently they just they just lit up the whole waterfall of the Spicket River. Um, I get, they were must have been inspired by Amesbury, and they went back <laughs> in Methuen and they've done a similar thing. So they've got an equally beautiful uh, kind of a beautifying effort they're doing around the Spicket River. Um, this was that piece on Lawrence Street that really stood out for me. Um, this person said, this is where I share most of my memories, whether it was taking a bus or buying pastelitos from a food truck, eating at a restaurant, or just buying from stores and walking around with friends. Baker's Meadow in Andover. The person said, my husband and I walk our dog here at least once a day. It's become a treasured place to connect to nature and calm our minds, especially over the last few months. 
Coco Brown, which is Haverhill's uh, com a community space in, in Haverhill focused on people of color. The Haverhill Farmers Market, uh, it's been around since 1978. They recently moved it to a, a giant empty parking deck in the middle of downtown. And uh, it's gotta have something like 40 vendors and it's, it's, it's popping every Saturday morning. If you go there, it's, uh, it brings a ton of life to, uh, to downtown. And, uh, and this is a good example of why this stuff's important. If you were sitting in an office somewhere and you're thinking of, oh, well, and actually this, this site, this is a, a part of town that's getting redeveloped. Um, and on paper, it looks like a parking lot. You know, probably a, a falling apart parking lot that's a little neglected and, and probably not totally well used. But in reality, it's, it's a place that hosts a really important community event, a place that hundreds, if not thousands of people attend to throughout the course of the summer. So when we talk about, you know, redeveloping or when we talk about changing communities, how do we do that in a way that incorporates these elements rather than displaces them? And that for planners is, is the important task that we have um, to help be more holistic about our, how, we, you know, how we move forward. Old Town Hall, this is a, a venue uh, that Pantucket Arts Foundation uses to do a bunch of uh, youth events. Marches Hill, another great example of, this is 90% of the time, this is just kind of an empty hill in Newburyport, but when it snows, it's the light of the neighborhood. This is where every kid goes to go sledding and, and bring their families. And it's, um, uh, it transforms from a, from a hill into you know, a little amusement park, essentially. Uh, so, speaking of amusement parks, Salisbury Beach Carousel. And these are just but a few of, of the things that people contributed. You know, we, we did this exercise in the middle of COVID and with everything going on, we. We, we, there's always more work to be done. We can always collect more resources, but this was our first kind of uh, um, first take at it. And this is, we had something around 150 different dots on the map that were contributed. Um, and you can still contribute. If there's something in Amesbury that, that you wanna see represented, um, you can add a point to the map uh, right there. And it's, it's live, but this is a tool. It's a tool that communities can use to, to survey a neighborhood and gather information about what people value in that neighborhood. It's a tool uh, developers can use to get more information. It's a tool any of us can use, it's open source. I mean, we make this for, for anybody's use. Um, it's a way to, to make visible all of these important things that um, we value in our homes, uh, in our communities, um, and to, to quite literally put them on the map. So I'm gonna I'm gonna end on a, on a couple notes here. Oh, hold on, let me jump down to the the final slides. So what we can start to ask is if people have some questions, go ahead and start putting them in the chat. And then after Nate's slide here, then we'll, we'll engage in some conversation. So I'll leave this on a uh, kind of a call to action. Like what is, what is to be done? Um, I always, I don't sugarcoat it. I always uh, start with funding, 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 funding. Uh, fund what we value. Uh, and it's clear that uh, we value arts and culture. <coughs> it's clear that these are important things for us. Um, and if municipalities or state government committed just 1% of their budget to cultural resources, it would be absolutely transformative. I um, mean, it's a successful model that's used in other countries throughout the world. Secondly, we can treat culture just as we would treat any other essential community element. We can identify it. We can align resources and visions to protect and grow it. Um, and thirdly, we can build ecosystems by connecting individuals, organizations, by having public events and engaging people through placemaking or through the arts or through talks like this um, to help build arts and culture coalitions and strengthen regional ties. And I'll end on a, on a note. This was written by uh, author Kurt Mullen and he's a Newburyport guy and he contributed uh, to uh, the, the expression book that we put together. 
Uh, and it, it gave me goosebumps when I first read it, but he said, in our lockdown isolation with phones in our hands and computers on our laps, we found that we need our cultural places, those places that give us meaning and a sense of belonging like never before to feel connected. And uh, given COVID-19 and everything we just went through, it, it certainly rang true for me. So uh, I'll, I'll share the time here. I won't be a total hog. And I Absolutely. just wanna thank everybody for, uh, for, for listening and participating. It was, it was great. Nate, thank you. I, uh, it's, it, there's a lot to um, process. I mean, I think, um, you know, just zooming in on the meaning of community, seeing kind of what I think were some shared values around, you know, the um, elements that you make a thriving community is inspiring, you know, especially for a small cultural organization that, you know, is making our way and trying to to make a difference in Amesbury. So I, I, I enjoyed this. I learned a lot from you. We have a couple questions that have come up. First, um, I know uh, Pam Fenner was curious about the workshops with ECCF and the Bar Foundation um, and wondering how many people from Amesbury were there. I know I was at one, I enjoyed it and I was inspired from that. I think uh, Mayor Gove also, before she was Mayor G Gove, was part of one of those programs. Um, but do you, did you keep statistics or is that um, not? We, we did. I don't have them at, at my fingertips, but they, I'd have to dig into the, into the files there. I don't know if, if Karen, if you're still on the call, if that's a number you've got you know, uh, on the top of mind, but um, it is something that we tracked. Yep. Yeah, we definitely did, and we can get you that uh, information. We have all the attendees from from those workshops. Um, Amesbury was well represented, you know, by some artists and by your current mayor, um, yep. Yep, uh, who was the head of the chamber at the time. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. Was it? I I was at the program in Beverly, and uh, it was um, also inspiring. I mean, I think, again, for a small nonprofit organization to see, you know, the um, trajectory of some of these projects and the difference it makes in communities is inspiring. Um, you, you know, Nate, from looking at um, other places where there are active um, community development projects that are culturally focused, you know, are you... Um, feeling like the Merrimack Valley is in the middle of the curve, ahead of the curve, way behind the curve? What are the things that you think need to happen to uh, move us all along forward? That's a really good question. And um, then my gut would say we're in the middle of the pack. I think there's a lot of things that, that we have that other communities are just not there yet and would kill for. Um, mm -hmm. We've got some wonderful uh, institutions here um, we have some wonderful arts partnerships um, uh, and people just in the ecosystem in general that are engaged and smart uh, and, and mm -hmm. doing some really progressive stuff. And that being said, we've got a long way to go. Um, there's, there's always more work to be done. And um, I mean, uh, I'll throw myself on, on the, the table here. I mean, uh, Merrimack Valley Planning Commission, you know, we, I mean, we, we've been in this space now for two years, so it's great that we've been in it for two years, but um, we have a lot of work still left to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what well, question from uh, Bonnie Brady asking about um, making a cultural map of Amesbury. And, you know, if we did such a thing, what could we then do with it? How do we use that um, cultural map as um, catalyst? Right, right. So, so one of the reasons we wanted to start kind of our planning exercises with, with a cultural map is because it's a great way to engage people. Um, everybody cares about things in their community, even if it's as simple as, oh, I like going for you know, a walk. Um, so it's a great way to begin to have that conversation and to begin to engage the public um, about what they value in their own communities. Mm -hmm. And from there, you can, you know, 
begin to gather data over, over important features or important things um, that you want to protect or grow or preserve. Um, and uh, once, you, once you have people engaged and folks uh, you know, uh, and some, some assets identified, putting together a plan, um, where do you wanna be in five years? Mm -hmm. How do you wanna grow? Uh, what are you missing that you wanna see? What are you losing that maybe you're at risk of losing? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. kind of analyzing your own strengths, weaknesses, okay. and, and kind of trajectory. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to do that in a vacuum. So that's why I always encourage, uh, so I, I, I'm a fan of, of doing this sort of mapping work and engaging people first and then doing the, and then doing the planning second. Your, um, the cultural, um, Focal points. The mapping program is still live on the um, Merrimack Valley Planning Commission website. It is. I've gone and I've added a couple. Um, so um, you know, for those who are interested, you know, we, we could share that link. I think I did a newsletter piece on a Saturday, and in our e-news included a link to that um, resource. We'll be sending out an evaluation for the program. And uh, maybe Bonnie, you and I can make sure we put that up. Oh, there it is. Nate's already added it, but we'll make sure that that gets out. And uh, our Amesbury community can flood Merrimack Valley Planning Commission with the um, awesome cultural resources that are in our, our community. Please do. Yeah, this was, you know, we, we, we tried to do the whole region, which is, uh, it's a, you know, it was a lot. Um, so, uh, I thought it like uh, it was a great start, but there is it is far, far from complete. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so to really do something that's focused really intensely on a downtown or a neighborhood, I think yeah. you'd get a lot of value out of something like that. Yeah. Um, I think we'll take one more here. And then um, what I'll ask Meryl is that, you know, we can unspotlight Nate and then we'll have our, you know, community conversation for you know, another 10 minutes or so. Um, Pat Boyle-Steed um, and Mary Chatney both have been part of um, Amesbury Listens or Amesbury Talks, a, a project that Mayor Gove has started. And you know, I think this might be part of you know, that process that you're describing, Nate, where there's uh, inventory that's being developed and people have an opportunity to input you know the things that are important and hopefully that'll lead to a master plan where those elements are what you know get um, valued a little bit more um all right so um there's one last question from susan han I'm from rockport and connected to amesbury through lowell's boat shop what organizations do you normally work within town's name you know, who, who is your um, clientele, if you will, who, who do you, who brings you in? So uh, really our, our clients are, are the municipalities themselves. So mm -hmm. we work with their planning staff or DPW department or uh, the mayors and managers um, at the executive level themselves. So that's, that's how we, um, those are our, our clients, so to speak, but we're, we're always coalition focused. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, they, they may be the people who bring us into the conversation, but we, we thrive in bringing other partners to the table, whether that's foundations or nonprofits or, or whoever the partners may be. Um, and I'm going to guess, Nate, if people had questions for you, they can find you on the Mac Valley Planning Commission website. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll put my, my email in the chat. Um, okay. I'm always happy to. To, to talk, um, um, or you can go to, to our website, mvpc.org and yep. see uh, what, else we, what else we do. Um, and then I'm gonna say, thank you, Nate. This was, um, I wasn't exactly sure where we were gonna land with this, but I think we landed in a great place. I um, think, you know, having a sense of the meaning of community Kind of looking at the big list of um, you know elements that we all hold dear, and then thinking about how those things can be part of the work that we do to make a vibrant uh, town 
it's really great. So thank you for being willing to be on our Bailey lecture. And thank you everybody for being, you know, with the program tonight. And um, Meryl, if you wanna let the fun begin, you know, we can unmute people and I'm willing to hang for a bit and we'll just continue our conversation. And if um, people have questions for Nate. One thing, uh, uh, thank you, John. And thank you everybody for your participation. I genuinely love seeing how much people love their own communities. It's, it's yeah. you know, it's what I do for a living, but but it's the that's the best part of it. And um, I did want to quickly plug that um, ECCF, our partners in our cultural planning uh, uh, project, um, they uh, have agreed to sort of fund cultural planning consultations in communities. So oh, wow. this would be um, at, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Karen, but at no cost or subsidized cost to communities. Um, they've got a great team um, over there at ECCF, but they are putting more resources into further growing um, uh, uh, the arts and culture um, in the Essex County, uh, of which Amesbury is, is one of them. So uh, Karen put the, the put the link in the chat there to learn a little bit more information, but it's great. Mm -hmm. It's a great resource. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And with that, I'll, I'll end. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I see some new faces and some friendly ones. Um, did we just lose Greg Calling, our architect? There he is. Greg, you've been part of many of these programs. So, um, you know, and maybe this is like old school for your, for your someone with architecture training, but um, it's happy to feel validated and reinforced for a lot of the things we're working on with the History Center. Actually something that <clears throat> I'm not, I haven't been familiar with cultural planning as a planning tool. Um, it's, I'm actually on a planning commission here in, in the small town of Stratford, Vermont, and there's no piece of the town plan that we're working on that addresses cultural resources. So this has been eye-opening for me. And I've always been involved with cultural facilities. I'm helping with, with the project up here for a, um, a historical society. So. So have you got some fuel for the fire there? People are gonna wonder what happened to Greg Calling when you come to the next meeting. Stir things up. Yeah, it's awesome. So, but yeah. I've always been loved being volunteering and being involved in, in um, with community organizations that, that have a public function and mm -hmm. um, celebrate the history and diversity of communities, so. Yeah. And that's what the Carriage Museum is doing, the IHC, and that's why everyone's so excited about it. I see Pam Fenner has her hand up. I think that means something. <laughs> I, I thought that's what we do is raise our hand. Um, I was going to tell um, Nate that in addition to um, John and the Amesbury um, Carriage Museum, uh, there's the Amesbury Cultural um, Council, which um, does so much within our, our community and we have a thriving artist community. But uh, along with the Carriage Museum is Amesbury Treasures. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's a loose organization that's been formed about 20, 23 years ago. Of those of us, uh, about eight or nine um, historical, museums or locations within the town. And I just wanted to point that out for you to, to uh, have that as part of your cultural yeah. mapping. Uh, we, it's a loose organization. Um, we haven't had meetings because of Zoom, but um, our individual institutions, whether it's the Whittier Home or the Carriage Museum or Lowell's um, tend to sponsor various events here in town. But it was a way to unify um, uh, and coordinate some of our activities um, for the community. We're, um, Pam, I'll mention, um, we're actually um, scheduling um, open house at the History Center 
before we're even open, but we'll reach out to the Amesbury treasures because we see, you know, that venue as being a place that, you know, maybe we can inject a little more activity within that, that group. Um, we did that, I think, five years ago, and we'll, we'll do it again. So I wanted to ask Karen, Karen Rasubin, thank you for being part of this. Sure. Um, and, you know, I, I, I am so thrilled to see that Essex County Community Foundation is helping with that sort of cultural audit. It's um, excellent. Um, you must be thrilled to see, you know, the um, follow up from some of the creative county work that mm -hmm. started. Um, and I'm sure you're also um, eager for the COVID restrictions to begin to slip away so we can get back to some of that work. Well, that is true. We haven't stopped though. And a lot of what we've been doing is supporting the ability of people to do their online and virtual uh, offerings. You know, we're mm -hmm. starting a countywide um, uh, platform to support virtual op offerings. Um, and we're gonna be rolling that out this spring. Um, I also want to say that Anna Calmonero is on the call here too. She is on, she sits on our CCI steering committee, creative uh, county initiative wow. committee. And um, Jennifer Welter was on the call too. She was part of the core team with Nate and uh, and our folks for the cultural mapping piece. So awesome. it's been such a pleasure to work with Nate. Yeah. I gotta say he's been such yeah. a great partner, and he's right. such a great ambassador for this work for all of us. It's you yeah. know. Really blessed to have him. So, it's it feels like a really reachable um, activity, mm -hmm. and yields something that's pretty clear and tangible. So um, it'll yeah, be fun. Yeah, I do yeah. want to say too that the, what we're offering now it, with that link for uh, the consultation is one next step. You know, taking the mm -hmm. planet, the mapping that we've done, and then for the communities that want to go a little bit deeper. Just having mm -hmm. a three or four hour consultation with our national consultant who we've been working with, Tom Barup, all the way along. Awesome. He'll look at existing plans, master plans, whatever exists in the city or town, mm -hmm. and then work with a small group of key, you know, key stakeholders to try to make a plan to go forward, you know, and try to mm -hmm. resource a full cultural plan if that's at, you know, on the table or any smaller part of uh, it. So um, and that's, yeah, that there's no charge for that. We're, we're right. Around. Is it usually um, the municipality that makes the ask or is it a uh, nonprofit? Uh, there's one, uh, actually Donna Keefe is on the call too. She's from Salisbury and she uh, reached out after some other meetings with her um, as she's with the local cultural council in Salisbury. Okay. And she awesome. had to pull some things together. And then the mayor's office in Newburyport um, has reached out for that, and um, uh, there's a group in Andover who are utilizing that service now mm -hmm. as well. So three of the right. MPPC towns are already yeah. deep, and there's a few others who have the application. So and and they're interested. So right. it's it's a good thing that we can do. You know, we're we're thrilled to be able to do it. Great. Well, with that, I think I'm going to call our meeting adjourned. I want to thank everybody for being on the call. Nate Robertson, um, you, I um, have a coffee ready for you, or actually I'll get you a fresh coffee when you come to Amesbury. You can enjoy the Market Square Bakehouse and I'll show you the, the mill yard and the falls. Um, but it's been a thrill to, to meet you. And I love the energy and the creative ideas that you bring to your work. And uh, thank you everybody for being with us. And thank you to the Bailey family for being such an important part of our community. Um, it's um, I'm humbled and honored to be doing the work that I'm doing. So onward and upward we go. Thank you everybody. Thank you. And have a good night. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, John.